My name is Kurt Vollmer and I am the new Extension Weed Specialist. I'm actually based out of the Y Research and Education Center and not College Park, so I'm pretty close, which is nice. So today I'm going to give you a quick herbicide update on some new products and talk about herbicide resistance and herbicide resistance management. New products to talk about uh, in corn and soybean. The first product I want to mention is Shieldex from Summit Agro. Uh, the active ingredient in this is to purulate. It's a group 27 herbicide or an HPPD inhibitor, a bleaching herbicide, similar to Armazon and Impact. It's labeled for post in corn, works best when you combine it with a little bit of atrazine, uh, and works on both annual grasses and some broadleaves. Uh, the Shieldex name has been around, however, this new this is a new formulation, Shield X 400 SC re actually replaces uh, the formulation of Shield X 1.33. Uh, the next chemical I'm going to talk about is Tough 5 EC from Belkim. Uh, the active ingredient in this is Pyridate. It's a group 6 or a PS2 inhibitor, a photosynthesis inhibiting herbicide. Um, it's not a new active ingredient. It was registered in the United States up until about 2007, uh, but this company is looking to get it re-registered, um, looking for post control in corn and soybeans, uh, contact broadleaf control. However, again, uh, we're still looking at getting this project registered. Uh, Axial Bold from Syngenta, a con combination of Panoxidin and Phenoxaprop, uh, both group one herbicides, uh, used for post-grass control in wheat and barley, and this formulation will replace the current ac Axial XL. Uh, Gramoxone, not, certainly not a new product, uh, Paraquat, uh, new formulation, Gramoxone 3.0. This is going to replace the old SL 2.0. Only difference is there is a higher load concentration of gramoxone. Um, there is also going to be some new requirements for being able to apply gramoxone that uh, David will talk about later in his talk today. Uh, Authority Edge uh, from FNC. Uh, this is a combination of sulfentrazone, a Spartan or Authority, plus pyroxysulfone, a Zidua, uh, labeled for soybean. Uh, this is similar to Authority Supreme, has the same active ingredients, but, the, w but with a higher load concentration of sulfentrazone with activity on both annual grasses and broadleaf weeds. And finally, uh, Pixaro. Uh, pro new product from Corteva, which is a mixture of haloxifen, which is Elevor, group 4, and, fluorox and fluoroxapir, uh, labeled for wheat, barley, and triticale control, and broadleaf wheat control. Uh, here we have a list of the uh, dicamba and 2,4-D type products that are available and will be available. I want to point out that um, um, with Corteva, you have Fexapan, Bear, Extendamax. These are dicamba alone type products. Uh, same with Ingenia 5, the Ingenia 1.5L. That's also a lone dicamba product. There are also mixtures available. Uh, tank mixes for dicamba products to give you a little bit more residual control. Uh, the Ingenia Pro, which contains dicamba plus Zidua, should be available soon, however, it's n not likely to be available this season. And you have Tavium from Syngenta, which is dual magnum plus dicamba. For 2,4-D products from Corteva, you have your Enlist 1, which is the 2,4-D choline, or the Enlist Duo, which is the 2,4-D choline plus glyphosate. Uh, incoming soybean technologies, uh, the Roundup Ready, Extend Flex, HT3 soybeans tolerant to dicamba, glyphosate, and glufosinate. These soybeans are not yet registered. Uh, the Credenz Liberty Link GT27 beans from BASF, uh, these are going to be tolerant to Liberty, 
glyphosate and Elite 27, uh, which is a similar product to Balance. Uh, the little, the LLG 27 soybeans do have export approval. However, the Elite 27 herbicide is not yet registered in the U.S. So you can plant these beans, you just can't spray the Elite 27 over the top of them. It's similar to what the issue we had a couple years ago with Extendamax and being able to plant the beans, but, th but then not being able to actually spray the dicamba over them. Uh, the Enlist beans, uh, tolerant to 2,4-D, glyphosate, and glufosinate. Uh, soybeans are being sold and are available to plant. Both uh, the Enlist Duo, which is the 2,4-D and glyphosate, and the Enlist One, which is again the 2,4-D alone, is registered for the U.S. Corn, the corn crops are also approved, which are tolerant to glyphosate, glufosinate, 2,4-D, and Assure 2. So, current status of herbicide-resistant weeds in the United States. The important thing to remember is there are no new herbicide groups in advanced development trials. In fact, the last group was introduced about 20 years ago. So therefore, we must rely on the current technologies and current modes of action we have available. Unfortunately, the number of herbicide-resistant weeds continues to increase. In 19, it's nothing new. In 1972, this was the first reported case of resistance in Maryland and actually the first, first reported case of resistance in the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, today, we have 13 species that are confirmed to be resistant to herbicides. And the Unfortunately, the number of acres infested with weeds that are resistant to one or more herbicides uh, continues to increase. We have uh, three species in Maryland that are confirmed to be resistant to multiple herbicides and one that we suspect to be resistant. Those species are Italian ryegrass. We've seen resistance to the group one herbicides, which are the graminicides, the ACC ACE inhibitors, and the group two herbicides, which are your ALS chemistries. Mare's tail, we've seen re resistance to uh, group nine or glyphosate, and we also suspect that there's, a lot, there's some areas with resistance to group two, the ALS inhibitors. Palmer amaranth. Palmer amaranth is starting to be a big problem on the shore and, on the, and in western Maryland as well. Uh, Palmer amaranth is a very prolific seed producer and it grows very fast, especially when it's hot. Um, another thing about Palmer amaranth, Palmer will be on the state noxious weed list soon, which means that you're going to have to manage it. Now, I've been told by MDA that they are going to work with you as far as getting control. If you do everything you can, but you're still having problems, you're not going to be penalized. But unfortunately, it is still hard to control because it is like the mare's tail. It's resistant to the ALS and the inhibitors and glyphosate. A common ragweed which is fairly new for resistance in the area. We've seen common ragweed with resistance to glyphosate, the ALS inhibitors, and the group 14 herbicides, the PPO inhibitors. And unfortunately, uh, the group 14 herbicides, th those are things like Reflex, Valor, stuff we use for a lot for, or primarily for weed control and soybean. So if we lose this mode of action, it's going to be very tough to get a good pre-emergence control program going. Uh, some general herbicide con spray considerations and a little bit of basic weed science. So think about when, when you're planting and when you want to control your weeds. You basically want to keep your weeds, your field clean until that crop starts to canopy and shade out those weeds. As far as spray programs go, you always want to start clean. This is not clean. Those weeds are far too big to control. 
Then you want to apply your pre-program, especially in soybeans, as close to planting in po as possible. Why? Because your residual herbicides are only going to give you about four weeks of residual control before you need to put on that post-emergence treatment. We've done studies looking at seeing if we can maybe push this pre-residual program closer to our burn down timing, but unfortunately that just doesn't give us long enough of a residual control for some of these weeds like Palmer amaranth that can germinate throughout the entire growing season. Another thing about your post applications. With glyphosate, we really didn't have to worry about the size of the weeds. Uh, with things like Li Liberty, Dicamba, and 2,4-D, we are concerned uh, about spraying it when these, when these weeds are small, four inches or less. So horseweed as an example, that and that, that's fine, that, and this, that is too big to control. Do not call me and tell, and tell me that you have four, foot tall, four, four or five foot tall horseweed and you want to spray it. It's, nothing's going to be done. So some her herbicide options for the weeds I just mentioned, starting with uh, mare's tail for a burn down, looking at uh, gramoxone plus atrazine, uh, or Glyphosate plus atrazine plus group four, or even uh, Liberty plus atrazine. For post options, uh, limited dicamba plus 2,4-D, or Callisto or Liberty plus atrazine. Um, Callisto and Liberty don't work very well alone, and you will need to add some atrazine to that tank mix to control those weeds. For soybeans, uh, your fall application, uh, 2,4-D, dicamba, uh, burn down options, uh, 2,4-D, sharpen, germoxum, liberty, and glyphosate if it's a roundup if you have susceptible horseweed. Pre-emergence options, uh, your PPO in inhibiting herbicides, uh, Valor or Spartan, uh, plus a group 5 herbicide like metribuzin. And Add gramoxone if necessary to that burn down if uh, you didn't quite get all the weeds before. And again, post options are limited for mare's hair control. Um, glyphosate and ALS herbicides work great on susceptible species, but if, with resistance, again, you're re relying on Liberty, Dicamba, or 2,4-D products uh, for tolerant crop species and, again, smaller weeds. Uh, Palmer control uh, in corn pre-emergence, looking at a group 15 herbicide uh, plus atrazine, uh, for example, things like a bicep, harness extra, keystone, maybe add a little bit of a group 27, uh, that balance flex, Lexar, Lumax, et cetera. For post-emergence control, uh, 2,4-D, dicamba, or a group 27, uh, Callisto Impact Armazon Alatus, and, really, and it really works well when you add atrazine. For example, this is what Palmer amaranth looks like when you just spray it with Callisto alone. Notice it is a little, it is larger than we'd like to spray. Uh, notice the bleaching, but this plant might survive. This is what it looks like when you spray Callisto with atrazine. Notice uh, you've got a lot of good synergism there, and this plant will definitely die. If additional residuals are needed, uh, you can add Outlook, Dual, uh, Harness, or others with that post application. Just be sure to follow the label. And save those PPO herbicides, uh, things like Sharpen and Valor, for your soybeans. Uh, options for Palmer in soybean, your burn down options. Uh, 2,4-D or Paraquat plus Metribuzin, uh, pre-emergence, again, as close to planting as possible within one to two days. You want a group 14, uh, Valor or Spartan, a group 15, something like Dual or Zidua, plus Metribuzin. Post-emergence, uh, 
Residual herbicides that you can apply give you a little bit longer control after you've uh, controlled your weeds. Uh, uh, Femesifen, things like Preflex, Reflex, Flexstar. Uh, contact herbicides, these aren't going to provide you any residual control. Uh, things like Lactofen, uh, Dicamba, Glufosinate. And if, I do recommend with any uh, application for Palmer Amaranth, you do add some residual herbicides. Uh, so if you're just using that Lactofen or Dicamba alone, be sure to add some dual or sequence warrant outlook or some other residual herbicide that's going to give you a little longer control until that crop starts to canopy. And double crop soybeans, primarily you just need an effective burn down, pro burn down program, you know, uh, 2,4-D or Paraquat plus Metribuzin to give you a little bit of residual control going into the season. Ragweed control. In corn, atrazine, simazine, plus a group 27, balance, uh, and a group 4, uh, things like containing clopyrrolid, stinger, short start. Uh, post Glyphosate, if you have susceptible population, glufosinate, 2,4-D, and dicamba, again, when they're less than four inches tall. For soybeans, pre-emergence, um, unless you have resistance, the group two herbicides, chlorancelam, first rate the, with the authority products, they work really well, uh, plus group 14, valor and reflex. And, or if you do have resistance, we've seen uh, good results with group 13 or group 7, Commander or Lorox, plus Metribuzin. Post-emergence, 2,4-D, Dicamba, and Enlist and Extend Beans. Uh, group 14, again, if you don't have resistance, Cobra, Reflex, Ultra Blazer, and Glyphosate. And, and Lufosinate, again, to weeds less than 4 inches tall. So remember, with all the herbicides I've discussed so far and all the new herbicides, all new products and premixes are formulations of existing herbicides. There may be new active ingredients, new tank mixes, but there are no new modes of action. So let's take a quick review of active ingredients versus mode of action. Now remember, the active ingredient is the specific ingredient or compound that works to kill the plant. The mode of action is how the pest is killed or the pesticide's effect on, the, on plant growth. You can have many different active ingredients within the same mode of action. For example, uh, looking at the group one herbicides, the ACCase inhibitors, we see several active ingredients, diclofop, holon, uh, Fluazifop, Fusilade, Clethodem, Selext, Panaxidin, Axial, XL. These are all the same active ingredients within one mode of action. And it's the herbicides actually, or the weeds, will become resistant to a particular mode of action, not just a particular herbicide. So when we talk about resistance, think about there's always a chance that you'll have one single herbicide resistant weed, resistant to something you're going to spray. You spray it and susceptible weeds die, but that one plant lives. And those resistant weeds start to mature, and over time, those weed seeds are going to produce seed. If you do the same thing in year two, notice you have more herbicide resistant weeds. You spray that same herbicide that process, with the process repeating, and over time, in later years, you pretty much, your field's pretty much full of, say, glyphosate-resistant, Roundup-resistant weeds. So now is the time to worry about herbicide-resistant management. As I said before, there's always a small chance that you may have some herbicide-resistant weed in your field. If we take a look at this graph of herbicide resistance evolution over time, you notice that 1%, less than 1% chance of having a herbicide-resistant weed within, say, the first seven years. 
However, after year seven and by year eight, you start to notice herbicide resistance in your field, and by that, it's too late to manage with uh, herbicides alone. So just as an example, looking at uh, common ragweed and palmer amaranth resistance with uh, what I just mentioned, in this chart we have uh, the post-emergence options for soybeans. And I already said that um, we've had palmer amaranth resistance, both species are resistant to glyphosate, the group 9 herbicides. So I'm going to remove that option for our list of controlling common ragweed and palmer amaranth. We also know that we have group two or ALS resistance in, uh, in these species. So I want to take that out as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, common ragweed is resistant to uh, the group 14, the PPO inhibitors. So I will remove that from our options. Bassagrans, not a great herbicide for Palmer, so I will take that off as well. So, with the type of resistance we have in Maryland, we're left with only three different modes of action for controlling these species. We are fortunate. In other areas of the country, we've seen weeds, palmer and common ragweed that, it, that are resistant to 2,4-D and dicamba. We've also seen palmer amaranth that is resistant to uh, the PPO inhibitors inhibiting herbicides in other areas of the country. So that leaves, that could potentially leave us with two different herbicides for controlling common ragweed and only one herbicide for controlling uh, palmer amaranth. And again, herbicide resistance is primarily based on selection pressure. If you're relying on liberty only for your weed control program, it's not going to be long until you see resistance to that herbicide as well. So herbicide resistance management, rotate crops and herbicides. A lot of you do that already. Rotating crops allows us to use uh, different herbicide programs. Say you could use uh, atrazine and simazine followed by glyphosate and, and corn, then valor followed by glyphosate and soybean. However, this is not as good as using multiple modes of action, uh, multiple herbicides in the tank mix. Why? Because it's very rare for a weed to be resistant to two or more herb herbicides before that selection pressure takes place. Uh, here's an example of a study done out of Illinois looking at the probability of herbicide resistance when using multiple modes of action. On the y-axis here, this is the probability of developing resistance. On the x-axis, these are the number of modes of action used. Uh, and notice that as we, with the more, the more modes of action you use in your tank mix, the lower the probability is that you will develop herbicide resistance. Uh, use one and a half modes of action, got about an 80% probability that you're going to develop herbicide resistance over the next seven years. Uh, get that down to about uh, two modes of action, uh, two, and, two and a quarter modes of action. Then uh, you only have about a 25% probability of developing herbicide resistance. And with multiple modes of action, we need to make sure we use effective modes of action. Modes, um, tank mixes that are, that have the full rate for the target species, and there can't be any resistance in that tank mix. For example, Envive, good pre emergence herbicide for soybean. Envive is a combination of a group two herbicide, or actually two group two herbicides, and Valor. And for Palmer amaranth, for example, we already know that we have some resistance to uh, those group two herbicides as ALS inhibitors. If you spray in Vive, you are going to be able to take care of that ALS resistant Palmer. However, there's always a chance that you might have 
that one group 14 resistant weed in your field. And, you, and if you spray enzyme continuously, you are going to select for resistance. You're going to have weeds that are resistant to both the ALS, the group 2, and the group 14, the PPO inhibitors. And that product is no longer going to be able to give you control. So aside from herbicides, tank, tank mixing herbicides is good, but there, we do need to try other methods uh, for weed management. Uh, looking at integrated weed management. Um, this is using multiple tactics for weed control. Um, when I talk about integrated weed management, I'm talking about using mechanical, cultural, uh, biological, preventative, and, and chemical tactics. Uh, integrated weed management doesn't mean just switching up your herbicide program. You do need to try these different tactics. And by trying these different tactics, it does help to preserve our available herbicide programs. Now, I'll go over, uh, quickly just go over some of these tactics. Um, the first step and most important step in IWM is prevention. It starts with, again, making sure your fields are weed free at planting and planting certified seeds. Scouting, a very, very important step in uh, weed management. Uh, scout before you plant and after each herbicide application, just to make sure the, uh, uh, these herbicides are working to make sure um, you're able to control these weeds, again, when they're small. And don't let these weeds flower or go to seed. There's an old saying, one year seeding is seven years weeding. And with resistance, eh, seven years, again, to, until you're not able to control it. Um, be, ca be cautious of uh, where, you're sent, where you're harvesting, um, when you're harvesting, and keeping, uh, keeping your combine clean. Earlier I mentioned uh, the uh, other areas in the country where they have resistance to uh, 2,4-D and glyphosate and basically every herbicide uh, we have available. All of that is primarily in the Midwest. Fun fact, Palmer Amaranth in Maryland came in on a dirty combine. So when you're harvesting infested fields, be sure to harvest these uh, weedy areas last, especially if you suspect them to have herbicide resistance, and uh, clean your combine after you've harvested these weedy fields. And along with cleaning the combine, clean any, uh, clean any, clean any mowing or tillage equipment before taking it into another field. Cultural practices. These are practice strategies that are going to give the cover crop a com competitive advantage over weeds. Um, crop variety and selection. If you're going to select the crop, it's going to give you the most vigor and, and going to be the most competitive. Uh, cultural practice also allows us to alter planting dates, maybe uh, planting late so we can control a flush of weeds with a burn down or planting early to give that crop time to compete with the weeds. Um, reducing row sp spacing so the crop can, can reach canopy more quickly to shade out weeds. Uh, not, so much, not so much effective in corn, however in soybeans, if we reduce the row spacing from 30 inches to 15 inches, Notice that with 15 inch rows, that canopy closes a lot quicker. With the 30 inch row spacing, at the same time, you still see weeds in that, in that field. And uh, looking at targeting nutrient management options to allow uh, optim optimum crop intake while uh, denying access to the weeds. Uh, another cr uh, cultural rotation. Crop rotation. As mentioned before, it is good to rotate your herbicides with your different crops, but crop rotation also allows you to use different methodologies to control weeds so they don't adapt to one particular type of practice. Looking at uh, the, efficacy, uh, the efficacy of crop rotation, just looking at Palmer amaranth density and plants per meter squared. Uh, here we see the red bar represents a continuous soybean. The yellow bar represents a sorghum soybean rotation. And as you can see, there's a significant difference 
and polymer amaranth density with that sorghum soybean rotation versus just a continuous soybean. Another cultural practice such as uh, cereal rye. Uh, these species not only help with summer annual weed control, but they also help reduce winter annual weed density and competitive ability. So if you have a cover crop in the ground now, that's going to compete with your winter annual weeds and you're going to get a more effective burn down when it's time for soybean planting. Cover crops also create a mulch to prevent and suppress uh, summer annual weeds. And like winter annual weeds, these cover crops are going to compete with the summer annual weeds. They're going to help reduce the summer annual weed density, so there are fewer uh, smaller weeds to control. Cover crops can also delay, but they don't necessarily uh, replace the need for a post-emergence herbicide. Uh, for example, if we look at steel rye and Palmer amaranth, and as mentioned before, Palmer amaranth, you need to control it, spray your post application when the weed is less than four inches tall. This graph uh, shows the time or the days it takes for this species to reach four inches with and without a cover crop. Uh, with no cover, it only took about three days for Palmer to reach that four inch height. And Palmer grows about one inch per day, so that's not surprising. However, with cereal rye, that cover crop re helped to reduce the density and vigor of the of Palmer, and it only took about and it took 23 days for that for Palmer to reach four inches. Now, 23 days that's about as good as a good pre-emergence residual herbicide. Uh, mechanical options. Hand weeding, not, not a desirable practice for large infestations, but a necessary practice if you have a small infestation or you just have a few plants in your ditch. Remember, one year seeding is seven years weeding. Uh, mowing, uh, certain plants uh, tolerate mowing more than others. Uh, for example, a Palmer amaranth may be able to mow off some weeds, but with Palmer, it will, re it will reroot. Um, tillage, uh, cultivation, uh, in between rows, and I'll talk a little bit about strategic tillage here in a few minutes. Coming down the pipeline, um, flame weeding, flame weeding, it's, it's fairly new technology, not not a lot of research being done. You can, you can actually flame weed certain weeds like corn when they're small. And maybe down the line, little robots to do our weeding for us. <laughs> but I would like to circle back to this uh, concept of strategic tillage. And when I say strategic tillage, I mean deep plowing with a mold board. Uh, strategic being once in every once every four years or so to control weeds like Palmer amaranth. Palmer has, and all pigweeds, they're very small seeded and they don't last long in a soil seed bank, maybe three to four years. And by burying those seeds, you can effectively help to manage that population. Here's an example of cotton field uh, from Georgia. Here we see uh, continuous no-till. Notice how many Palmer plants are coming up there versus that mold board plow. So in this study, they actually saw uh, only about 15% of the weeds survived after about three years of mold board plow. Now, deep tillage is not something we really like to talk about much here on the shore because we have so much no-till. But with a heavy enough infestation of Palmer amaranth, it's up to you to decide whether or not it's worth to do, this, again, this one-time mold board plow to help control that population or lose your record for however many tier years you're, you've been in no-till. Uh, last talk, talk about um, in integrated weed management I'll mention is harvest weed seed control. And these are, this is mechanical and thermal methods to kill or remove weed seeds from plants still standing 
after harvest. And that is the one caveat to this harvest weed seed control that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the weed seeds must remain on the plant at harvest. Uh, fortunately, things like Palmer amaranth and Italian ryegrass, they retain about 90% of their seeds at harvest. And even, even common ragweed contains about, retains about 85% of its seed at harvest. So this is a potentially new method that could be used. Uh, this includes things like impact mills or seed destructors. Uh, basically, a cage mill integrated into a combine that crushes seed and shoots it out the back. Or chaff carts. Uh, carts that are pulled behind the combine that are used to collect the weed seed containing chaff. Again, this is a late season tactic used to sur manage surviving weeds and prevent uh, further seed from making it into the seed bank and contributing to future weed problems. This tactic has been shown effective. Again, it's used to reduce weed populations and not necessarily control them. This is a tactic that would need to be in place uh, and used year after year. Here's an example of looking at the reduction of Italian ryegrass tiller counts. This was a study done in Virginia looking at harvest weed seeds control, the red bars, and conventional harvest, uh, the yellow bars. And they found that in two out of three locations, using harvest weed seed control, uh, collecting uh, uh, these uh, weeds, weed seed union, using a chaff cart, they found that in one location, they saw a 28% reduction in Italian ryegrass tillers and a 67% reduction in Italian ryegrass tillers. Unfortunately, uh, harvest weed seed control is something that still needs to be researched. Um, there are a lot of uh, pros and cons with harvest weed seed control. I mentioned impact mills earlier. This is a very highly, this is a highly effective method because it destroys most of the weed seeds coming out of the chaff. However, uh, total cost is really high, uh, and high, high initial startup costs. Unless uh, costs go down for these particular types of machines, uh, I don't see it being used here in the near future. By the way, these seed destructors run about $100,000 a piece. Uh, chaff cart, a little less costly. It's fairly easy to use, however, it does slow down your harvest, out, your harvest operation. And there's a high capital cost associated with that. Uh, chaff lining, this is actually modifying your combine to create a, a row of chaff after, after you've harvest. It allows you to concentrate these weed seeds in that row for future management. Easy to use, relatively low cost, However, there's not much research been done on how we're going to manage those weeds in the chaff line. In some, in some areas of the country, you can just set the chaff line on fire. But a lot of time we have burn bans and can't do that. So with that, uh, herbicide resistance. You probably have it even if you don't know it. Look at, and look at incorporating some of these integrated weed management practices. So start planning. I'd certainly rather be a pessimist because then I can only be pleasantly surprised. The more uh, tactics you can use to control your weeds, uh, the better off you're, you'll be and the less surprised you'll be when something doesn't work. So if my brief spiel about integrated weed management piqued any of your interest, we will actually be holding some integrated weed management workshops uh, next month. Uh, well, closest one here will be in Chestertown on the 24th. There will also be a workshop shop offered down at the Eastern Shore, uh, Virginia Tech Eastern, Eastern Shore AREC in Painter on March 9th and two across the bridge in Frederick on March 23rd and in St. Mary's on March 25th. Um, this workshop will delve further into what is herbicide resistance, how to choose uh, different mechanisms of actions for your respective herbicide programs, 
as well as discuss more on how you can use these integrated weed management tactics I mentioned earlier. Um, one quick aside, uh, we've had a lot of tillage radish planted in this area and we haven't necessarily had the weather to uh, winter, for it to winter kill. So, a pint of Roundup uh, plus, a two for, plus a quarter Quart of 2,4-D has been shown to be most effective in controlling this weed. However, it does need to be controlled prior to this flower structure reaching four to five inches. And it's also important to make sure you're spraying it at Roundup and 2,4-D when the weeds are actively growing to get, you, to get the best control. Uh, additional resources available for integrated weed management. Uh, this website, Grow, IWM, has a lot of good, interesting uh, results from research around the region and around the entire country. Uh, practical Guide for Integrated Weed Management in Mid-Atlantic gra Grain Crops. Uh, this is a free uh, PDF download from this uh, Grow website. Uh, again, delves more into these uh, integrated weed management tactics I talked about earlier. The new version, the 2020 version of the Mid-Atlantic uh, Field Crop Weed Management Guide is available. Uh, this guide covers uh, corn, uh, sorghum, so soybeans, small grains, and uh, pasture herbicide recommendations. Uh, it is available uh, through the Penn State Publications Office. Call this number or go to the Penn State Extension website or just Google 2020 Mid-Atlantic Field Crop Production Management. It's $25 for a hard copy, uh, $15 for an enhanced PDF. And when I say enhanced PDF, I mean this is a searchable PDF. I really like using the enhanced PDF because I can search for wheat control for ragweed and soybean and I don't have to thumb through hundreds of pages of corn and sorghum. Or you can get a bundle if you, of a hard copy plus a PDF for $35. That, I'd like to acknowledge the following people. Uh, there is my contact information, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, the question was, what's going to happen if, if we lose atrazine or the legislature bans uh, latrazine? Um, unfortunately, uh, Losing atrazine would be a detriment, especially as I mentioned earlier, you're going to want to tank mix uh, multiple modes of action to help af to effectively control some of these herbicide resistant weeds. Atrazine is uh, very effective. Um, I mentioned using the group 15 herbicides in both corn and soybean. Fortunately, things like group 15, which is dual, dual magnum, they don't provide good control of common ragweed. So if we lose atrazine, that is going to be a fairly big issue. We cannot do without that particular herbicide in our corn weed control programs. The question was, uh, what works best for onion control and no no-till soybeans. Oh yes, it was uh, Star of Bethlehem, which is an onion relative. We've pretty much found uh, that you need a good burn down program with uh, germoxone working best to control those weeds before they even start to emerge. Any other Uh, so you know that in between, uh, we hear from our sponsors, so uh, we are going to hear from Kim Brown King from FSA, and then we'll hear from uh, Tony, our Queen Anne Soil Conservation District Manager. They have a few things they need to get you straight on, so listen up. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that ARC PLC sign-up is March 16th, so you want to make sure you visit your county office to sign those contracts. Uh, you want to give yourself enough time to give your 50-50 shareholders or landowners who retain some of that pasture ground time to return those contracts for signature. So please don't wait till March 16th. I also want to take a few minutes to talk about our um, CRP uh, status review process with this new farm bill. Um, with this process, we'll basically be visiting that CRP contract every two years. 
Um, this is just to you know make sure that your contract is meeting the standards. Um, we have particular problems in this area with woody growth and filter strips, um, noxious weeds, of course, and um, water leads going into our filter strips. So we're just going out to check to make sure you guys don't need some assistance with that and um, to make sure that those filter strips are meeting standards. So that's all I really have with this farm bill. So Tony? First off, we want to talk a little bit about the cover crop program. We're going to talk about the current cover crop program. So Sunday is March 1st. March 1st is a lot of things for farmers. One of it is, oh, we can start fertilizing our cover crops. For, and we can start killing our cover crops. But March 1st is the due date for your annual implementation report for nutrient management. If you do not turn in your annual implementation report for nutrient management, you will not get paid for this current year's cover crop. It's as simple as that. They're cutting back. So you have to be in full compliance with nutrient management to receive your payment. So if you haven't done it, you got a couple days to get it done and get it sent off to your uh, regional office. Another thing on this year's program, um, if you signed up for the early or late termination, you need to let your soil conservation districts know what fields you're planning on keeping by April 15th. We have to have time to go out there prior to May 1st to make sure it's still there, still living, and then you'll come back in and let us know when you kill it down, May 1st or after May 1st, and we'll have to come out again and verify that it's been burned down. So that's that $15 incentive you should signed up for, up to 500 acres for the late termination. It's a 500 acre cap, but, and you may not have signed up much, maybe you signed up 100 acres, but maybe you're thinking about 200 acres, stop by your office, ask your office, because really it's a money cap. You just want to see how much money's left on your contract that maybe you could do more than maybe what you signed up for. So you want to check with your soil conservation districts on your contracts. Um, to see if there's any money in your contract to do that late termination. But we need to know by April 15th the fields you're planning on keeping till May 1st. Um, next year's program, really the only new thing we have in stone right now for next year's program is the nutrient management certification form. Those are the forms that your consultant gives you this time of year and you have to bring it in with sign up to verify that you have a current nutrient management plan for this year. The first year they did that, they gave us all the way till February to get that form in. Last year they gave us till November. This year, if it is not in the office by July 17th, the last day of sign up, you will not get approved for the program. So I'm sure all of you in here are already currently getting your nutrient management plans done. So just make sure you have that form. If you want to bring it by our offices now, you can do that. We'll keep it till July, but we just have to have that for sign up or when the sign-up period ends, if that form's not in, you're not going to be accepted into the program. So with that note, I'd like to thank everybody. This year was a record cover crop year. We had 488,000 acres planted in the state. Um, of that, 65,000 acres were planted in Queen Anne. So that's a, detriment, that's a big uh, gratitude to you all for all the work you did to get it in. Um, one last thing, we're right in the EQIP sign-up right now. It goes through May, March 20th. So if you're thinking about um, something that you may want to sign up through EQIP, um, you need to, or RCPP, all the federal programs, um, stop by your district office as soon as possible because that ends on March 20th. So thank you, Jenny. Well, it's great to see this many people here. And uh, it's, it's glad to see you supporting agriculture. And I hope all of you are Farm Bureau members because uh, when we go to Annapolis, it's impressive when we have a group like this to show up. So uh, a lot of you, I know most of you are, but it's really important you do it. I want to talk some of the things we do for you. Uh, first off, I want to invite everybody to the, uh, our banquet is March 14th at Sellersville Firehouse. Um, Tickets are $25. You can see us at the booth or let Lorraine Moore know. She's a new secretary. Um, another thing we got coming up is March 20th, we have a trucking forum at Chesapeake College. So if you do any trucking or have someone else that is, uh, we'll have representatives from the state there. If you have questions, you can ask them there and you don't have to worry about being reprimanded for it or whatever. 
you can find out whether you're legal or not, what is legal, what's not, what's safe. Uh, it's another thing Farm Bureau is trying to do to make everybody safe. Uh, we don't want to find out on the road that we're out of compliance with something. And uh, we all want to go home with our families. We want to be safe. So that's what we're trying to do. A uh, little bit of talk what we've done. We, two weeks ago, I guess, we had a day in Annapolis. Um, we went over and we talked with some of the legislators. Uh, also that afternoon, we met and heard at the hearing of the House when they talked on chlorophos. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but that's the very chemical we need. Uh, but we're going to lose it. But it's an eye-opening in that day we've seen, I have to say, very impressive, the people that were opposition to it. They were out in large numbers. They were well-organized, well-spoken, and they're an educated group. It's what we face against today. Uh, in a sense, we got our tails kicked, but we did. Farm Bureau standing for you. We worked to try to get this so that it wasn't changed legislatively, it's changed in regulation. The difference there is the governor gets to say what we can do. Uh, so it's gonna be a phase out issue, that's what we're working for. Um, did they win in a sense, yes, but in a sense, no. We were able to keep it in regulation so they could not say they outlawed chlorophos. The important thing there is if they get that, the next thing they're coming after is glyphosate, atrazine, all down the line. So I think that's very important that what Farm Bureau is doing for you there, and we, that's why we need to be members and supported. Um, following up there, we did meet, the, the Maryland Board of Directors met with the governor. This is one of the things we discussed, and he's in agreement with us. Uh, that was the way to, to fight that. Um, I guess in closing, if I got a take home message for you, when you say what does Farm Bureau give me, it gives you a seat at the table. And chances are, if you don't have a seat at the table, you'll be on the menu. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. thank you.